said, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm going to break this session today into uh, three sections um, with a little bit of activity in between if we can. So I'm hoping that uh, you, uh, or hopefully some of you have used Google Jamboard before. Um, it's really easy. There's a, a link included in the slides where we'll um, be doing some activity using Google Jamboard. I just thought it might be a good way to get you in using some of the more foresight and futures oriented tools um, and do something that we call a futures wheel, which I'll talk about in um, a little while. So um, maybe I'll just get started with the slides. Uh, and the first is that there are that there are no facts about the future. And, and that's a fact about the future. But the reason there are no future facts is because the future doesn't exist. The future is not a place that exists in space or time as a, a predetermined or predestined place that we get to. It's actually something that we create. Um, and I should also say that there are three facts about futurists like me. So I'm a, a professional futurist um, or a foresight practitioner, depending on what day it is and who I'm talking to. Uh, and the, the facts that I can share with you about futurists are that we don't do predictions. Uh, so I can't tell you what the future is going to be like. Uh, and it's certainly not my role or my responsibility to predict the future. We can't actually predict the future because it doesn't exist. Uh, and so as a futurist, it's our responsibility to say that we don't know exactly what's going to happen but that we can help you think through the various possibilities. Um, what I'm gonna talk about today are some of those principles, but also some of the tools and, and methods that we use to help people think through the future rather than predicting the future. Uh, now the reason uh, we can't predict it is because it doesn't exist. And the three laws that are in front of you at the moment are taken from Jim Dator's piece that he wrote in 2007. And he imagined three laws um, or three rules about futures. Uh, the first being that it can't be predicted because it doesn't exist until it's happened. Uh, and any useful idea about futures should appear to be ridiculous. And the reason that uh, an idea is more useful if it's uh, initially ridiculous to us is because we question it or we laugh at it or we say it's ridiculous, that will never happen. And it becomes more of a provocation rather than a prediction. Uh, so anything that makes us think twice about possibilities uh, is very useful when we're talking about futures. And his third principle or rule around futures is that we shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. Now that's not actually a quote from Jim Dator. Um, he stole it or borrowed it from uh, Marshall McLuhan. Uh, and it's up to us to think about the futures that we want and therefore the futures that we shape. And that's really the theme um, of the first part of my, my session today. Uh, and as an example of the useful idea about futures, uh, I'd like you to think about where we were three, four, five, even six months ago. If anyone had said to us then that we wouldn't be going out of the house and that we wouldn't, uh, around the world globally, we wouldn't be able to travel, uh, that most people around the world were experiencing the same circumstances and that we would be threatened by a virus, uh, most people would have responded with, oh, that's ridiculous, that will never happen. Uh, but it isn't a ridiculous idea. It is actually uh, uh, one of the wild cards that's been used in future thinking and strategic foresight processes for nearly 20 years. Uh, this notion of a pandemic that might challenge us globally. So um, I'm gonna flick through the next few slides. As I said to uh, Roman when he invited me to be part of today, um, the slides are going to be available to you. So. I won't go through each one in detail. Um, I will pick out particular points uh, and I'm more than happy to um, share other uh, material with you if you're interested after we've finished the session today. Um, so because the future has to be created, it's really important that we have lots of ways of imagining and then creating futures, which is where design and things like speculative design, critical design, and design fiction, and also ways of designing become critical to making these futures happen. Because otherwise, 
futures just remain a dimension of our imagination. They're just what we see in our minds. Um, sometimes they're what we see or read about in fiction, like science fiction or uh, movies or, or, or television programs or other media that takes us into imagined futures. But until we actually imagine those futures, we, we tend to think that the future, uh, whichever one that is, is going to be like what we have now, which is why it's important that we not only understand that there are many different futures, but that it's up to us to imagine what they can be like and to create them. And this is where we come to a, a distinction between two terms that I'm going to use frequently today. Um, futures thinking, which is a broader umbrella term um, that embraces both the more academic and, and the study, uh, studies area, um, of which is future studies. But it's a way of thinking about new or emergent and unknown possibilities. So it's a discipline linked to anticipatory thinking, which is some of the points that uh, Ramon uh, raised earlier about the anticipation conference. Um, but it, it's a little bit different from strategic foresight in that strategic foresight is applying that way of thinking and using it in, in research in useful ways, whether it be practical applications in organisations, in communities, in businesses, uh, within government, or whether it's an exercise to explore potential futures so that we can think about what those possibilities that, that might emerge could be for us as people. And before I go too much further, I want to just say a, a couple of things that the, the practical aspect of, of futures thinking and strategic foresight is not just about trends or even the forecasting that we um, expect from, from futures work. There's a, a slight difference between forecasting, which is extrapolating or extending out from where we are and thinking more broadly about how something might emerge. Um, trends are very much current, and I'll, I'll talk about trends a little bit later. Uh, but the, the, the key point here is to understand that there are different ways of using these terms. And the most important aspect I find with, with futures is people realising that there are going to be different ways of expressing our feelings around futures and therefore we need to have bigger, better and more strategic conversations um, about futures and the possibilities that emerge from them. So here I'm going to quickly return to that quote um, from Jim Dato, stolen from Marshall McLuhan, about shaping our tools and our tools shaping us. Because what that really means is that we really get what we design. And so if we want to have certain types of possibilities, whether they be spaces or places or tools or objects and artifacts around us, then we need to imagine them and design them. Um, and that applies when we think about giving form to images of libraries of futures. So I, I found these uh, images online. The links are at the end of uh, this slide deck. Uh, and these are just um, examples of how a future library has been imagined. And in two of these cases, um, they've actually been given form. Um, the one at the very top of this slide is, a more, is an older, more traditional style library. But you can see that some of the nuances, um, both the, the structural elements and also the engagement of people and the use of things like books, for example, um, are still prevalent within those images of futures as we move further out um, from where we are now. Um, and the whole point of this is that when we think about futures, and I think every futurist has to use a William Gibson quote at some point, um, the, the future is, is all around us. So, um, it is also the thing that is looking back and it's up to us to try and think forward so that when we want to uh, really work through what it is that we, um, we, we imagine but also want to have, because that's, that's a key point with futures, that if we really want our futures to be a particular way, then it's up to us to do what we can to make them happen. Um, and so making sense of that fiction that the future holds for us that's up to us to make it a reality. Because if we don't want those very tech utopias uh, that you see in a lot of science fiction or those um, deep and dark dystopias uh, that we also see in science fiction and some of the scenarios that are in our world at the moment, um, if we don't want that to be the, world, the way the world is going to be, then we have to be the ones who imagine 
the possibilities, the alternate futures, and then find a way to make them happen. At this point, I thought I might just briefly pause and see if anyone has any questions. Um, are there any questions that anyone wants to ask? No? I can see a couple of comments in chat. Okay, well, what I'll do is go back to the slides, um, which I'm trying to do. Oh, great. Thank you. No, that's really good to know that it was clear. Thank you very much. Um, going to go back to this and ask you all the question about how you might imagine futures. I think I have to stop sharing this at this point just so that I can go back and share it again. Um, okay. So I'm asking you a question here but I'm not asking you to respond immediately to me. I'd like you to take just a few seconds to think about how you imagine futures. So whether that be tomorrow and what you're going to be doing or whether it's a week from now or a month from now or a year from now, possibly as things have changed quite a bit from where we are at the moment. And when we imagine those futures, what is it that we use? Do we look to images that we're familiar with or if we wanted to imagine what we were going to be doing a year from now, do you have particular things that you might do as part of that process of imagining futures? And are there particular things that you hope for? Are there things that you would like to be doing or are things that you'd like to see in your future? You might have favourite places that you go for inspiration. That could be your garden. It could be a favourite spot. Uh, in the, the place where you live. It could be a cafe, it could be using tools online. I, I don't know, but what I hoped is that you might be able to click on the link um, or, and be able to contribute to what I, I hope you can see. I'm just swapping to another screen. Bridget, if you can, if you can just copy the link to to the chat. Okay, I'll do that now. Okay, that should be there. So from that link, you should find this board, which I hope you can see. Now, there's a, a jam board, which I'm just trying to bring up as the image. Ah, great, some of you are there already. So on that board, um, each of those squares, the green, yellow, blue squares, are sticky notes. If you've used this before, then I apologise because I'm going to be telling you how to do something that you already know how to do. Uh, but if you don't know how to use it, then um, the best way is to just click inside one of those little squares and then edit it. And I, I, it, you, can, you don't have to write in English. Um, it would be great if you could just add your thoughts on how you imagine futures. And we'll put this together and share this uh, with everyone afterwards. So you might write, want to write something about your favourite inspiration point. Um, as I said, I love going to my garden for inspiration, sometimes because it allows me to think a little bit differently from sitting at my computer, and sometimes it just allows me to look at the caterpillars eating my broccoli and, and wonder why I get so mad with them for eating my broccoli because they have a right to exist too. Uh, 
So there will be different places that you might think of. And I hope that you can access that. Uh, Bridget, we can't edit the, the, the Jamboard, actually. We uh, can just okay. see it. You are. Oh, let me see if it needs. Let me. Can you edit it now? I'm refreshing the the page. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can see things <laughs> changing. Great. So you just click into each little square, and it should allow you to just edit the text. So, for example, I'm click on the top right, and it says edit. So can you see me editing the squares now? I can see some people have still only got view, but it should be editable now. Maybe try refreshing your screen. Sorry about that. I don't know why. These are great. So what this does is start to have us understand that there are many different views on how people see futures and what we expect from those futures. One of the big distinctions uh, within futures and foresight work is a little bit like design, um, acknowledging that there are always going to be multiple perspectives um, and that as part of those uh, multiple perspectives, we need to be able to uh, embrace not just the diversity of, um, of what is expressed by people, but that we might have different views on what is positive and negative for a future. Um, there are phrases that uh, I use a lot when I'm working with students or with clients and one of them is that my dystopia might be your utopia. But sometimes the things that we um, as people hold dear to us and, and think are amazing and really positive futures or really um, you know, engrossing, engaging futures um, could be really difficult futures for someone else. Um, what I look forward to uh, at my age and what I, I want to see in the world over the next 20 or 30 years might be very different from what each of you want to see. And, and that puts a lot of pressure on us when we're thinking about imagining futures for not just small communities but for global populations when we think about what do we want um, as, a, as a group of people. I'm loving I'm loving seeing all of your comments in the Jamboard. That's great. That's really, really wonderful. So 
now that you've had a chance to explore that as an exercise, does anyone have any questions for me before we before I, I move into you know, the next section? This is one of the things that we might do as part of a horizon scan, an environmental scan, just to get a sense of people's expectations in the same way that in a design project you would maybe have a conversation with your client or your team about what it is that they think are the expectations for the project and what kind of outcomes they might have in mind. Now, with design, there's often a very specific outcome, um, whether it's a particular object or, or service or process that needs to be designed or whether it's something less specific but there is still an expectation of an outcome. Um, with a lot of futures work, there is no uh, definitive um, ex expectation except the exploration of futures and futures possibilities. So um, what I might do then, I'm just have a quick flick at what you're doing. This is, uh, I can see the, the board, it's amazing. It's really wonderful. Yeah. That's great. Okay, well what I'll do is just go back to uh, the slide deck. Um, and go back to this question about how we might create that fiction that we will have become. But this is about thinking through how do we make those futures real? If we want a future with more automation or less automation, or we want a future where there is greater equity and, and greater accessibility to certain technologies or certain tools or things like education or health services, or that everyone has universal basic income. If they're the things that we think we want in the future, then how do we create that? How do we make that happen? This is where future thinking and design thinking have similarities, but also a couple of differences. So the first is that future thinking is very much at an individual level, but usually happens through group processes. So whether that be within an organization that has a design team or through a community group, whether it be a social innovation project or a community organization that's running a design process. A lot of um, a lot of futures work and design work will be done in teams, but futures tends to be less at a simple design team level and more at the level of organization or community um, or, or different kinds of um, less um, institutionalized groups. Of course, foresight work happens within organizations like government. Uh, and large companies, uh, but it's more about that individual being able to bring foresight as a capacity, so as a way of thinking, not here talking so much about uh, strategic foresight tools and processes, but more about us as individuals having the ability to think longer term and think um, more deeply about where we might be in five or ten years' time. Uh, one of the challenges with foresight work is not just about what we want to do and where we want to go and who we are and, and whether we're different from others, but also that challenge of being able to think out into the future, out in time by two or three or five or ten or even 15 years or more. Some of the work I do might only be over the next 10 to 15 years in terms of uh, future thinking, but some of the work I've done has been 50 years out. Um, I, I love the idea of doing more at the 50 to 100 year level, but it's really hard. Um, and that's not to say it's a bad thing, but it, it's hard in a different way from just being hard to think through. Uh, and so that time horizon is, is really important when we think about the futures that we're moving into. We have to think about all of the changes that go with that. Design tends to be a little bit more short term in its focus, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, the, when foresight and design come together, uh, it's an amazing partnership. Um, both foresight and design are about asking deeper questions and solving problem using the, the mix of divergent and convergent processes. Uh, with both foresight and design, we want to have that beginner's mind. We want to not jump to the first answer. We don't want to, um, we, we suspend judgment about having the right answer. And hopefully in design, we suspend judgment about that right answer for long enough that we get to work through a number of different answers. Because by being open to all of those possibilities and all of the different 
opportunities that we can pursue, whether it be around futures or artifacts that help us shape futures, uh, then you know, we, we can shape the, the futures that we actually want. And by that, I mean, if, we, if there are particular artifacts that we want as part of those futures and we think that they are things that will get us to a future, then they're the things that we need to be focusing on. So for example, if we really think that electric vehicles are something we should be using more of, then when we as individuals think about buying a new car, uh, we think about buying an electric vehicle before or a hybrid before we think about buying something else. If we think that uh, there needs to be greater access to uh, certain um, objects or, or products in the market, then we have to think how do we shape those markets, how do we create those markets so that there is more equity. So if I take that back to libraries in, in, in particular, if we want libraries to be more open and accessible, then how do we as individuals ensure that the, the, the policies and the processes and the programs and the, the physical spaces that we have for libraries are open and accessible. What is it that we can do at that individual level that say, well, we know that this is going to be challenged, but how can we deal with that? Um, and this, this idea of complexity is really critical, that the world we live in is a complex adaptive system. And for many years, we've, we've had people telling us that we need certainty. But actually what we need to do is learn to deal better with uncertainty. Uncertainty is, is innate. Um, it's, it's part of the world that we live in. Um, but we've got used to being told that there is one art. So we've got used to thinking that there is a future coming that we have to accept. Uh, whereas, and I think this is where there's a great connection with speculative design and critical design, that we can think through these possibilities and we can give them form. We can use design um, as a provocation, as a means of opening up a better conversation around the things that are being designed for us. Uh, uh, foresight and design have some differences too, and I've just mentioned a couple of them, in that you know, foresight generally takes that longer term view. Uh, it depends on the, you know, the kind of work that you're doing and, and the focus of a project, but compared with design, a lot of the time you're focused on today or that immediate future, whether it be the next six to 12 months of a sales cycle or the, the, the next two years of a, a project in development. But most design is linked back to a commercial imperative and therefore it will have what seems to be a, a shorter term view. Foresight also um, uses a, a, a bigger systems approach. So not just systems thinking and approaches, um, in the way that it shapes things, but the longer term perspective. So looking at consequences, which is something we'll explore together today. But that notion of the, the longer term impacts um, and consequences of one thing on another. Um, design tends to be grounded more in, in where we are right now. So the immediate needs of a business or the, the immediate demand of technology, or where I've said here on the slide, user in inverted commas, that we have this notion of user-centred or, or human-centred design, which very much privileges people. Uh, and we need to be mindful that design has consequences and it has an impact on, on people who we don't necessarily create it for. Design also has bigger impacts um, on those who are not meant to be using it. So design has, has impacts on, on the environment, it has impacts on, on animals, it has impacts on resources, it has impacts on community and society. We don't always think about that uh, when we're, we're going through a design project. Um, and foresight is very much in, in the realm of inspiring those bigger visions um, around possibilities for futures to come. Whereas design is grounded in, in the, the thing that we need today and creating some kind of artifact that we, we feel we need. Um, another subtle difference um, is the optimism and, and confidence that, that often comes, uh, the very positive approach uh, within design practices of you know, there will be an outcome, we will get there, we will have a solution. Uh, in foresight work, uh, we very much get used to there not always being the ideal solution. It's, it's going to be the best we, we can have. Um, and that accompanies um, the principles of hope rather than optimism, but hope that you know it might not go that well, but we will do the best we can. Uh, and some people talk about you know, 
being hopeful of the best possible outcome, uh, knowing that the thing you really want might not be the thing you really get, but you will be able to, to, to deal with what is given to you, which is a pragmatism um, and, and it, it, uh, that, that comes with human experience, but also um, as we build resilience around change. Um, this is uh, just a, a quick map of, of things that line up and maybe don't line up and some differences between the designerly and creative ways of design practice versus the more anticipatory and prospective ways that are used in foresight. So most of you will have heard of uh, or, or used um, design thinking and human-centered design. Um, design is, is constantly charged with being the way of, of solving problems, particularly wicked problems, which by definition are wicked and, and can't be solved. But design is, is put out there as this means of, of addressing really big issues and, and global challenges. It's not always capable of doing that. Um, but designerly and creative ways of thinking uh, are certainly embedded within organisations focused on innovation. And the the principles of innovation are seamlessly aligned um, with a lot of design practice. There are, again, differences, uh, but the notion of innovation and change and improvement um, is very much akin to uh, a lot of design practice. Um, there are also principles, depending on the kind of design that you're doing, linked to lean and agile um, that uh, I'm not going to go into today. But the, the idea that we can do something quickly and learn from it um, is, is very much akin to that resilience that we have as, as we work in pragmatic ways in futures thinking. Um, some of the other aspects of designerly and, and creative ways of, of working through possibilities are speculative and critical design. I'm really glad that there's a session on that today. Um, thinking about design scenarios, but not just the current use of design scenarios, uh, perhaps in time, design will learn to think more forward about uh, the, the design scenarios that it works with, uh, that it, it can be more futures oriented in the way those uh, scenarios are crafted. Uh, and then there are the, the things that are considered the what Nigel Cross talks about as the designerly ways of doing and knowing. So using intuition, a uh, combination of your techno technical and, and craft experiences and skills alongside deductive and abductive and inductive reasoning. And then, of course, there are those design processes and planning um, and the artifacts of like prototypes and sketching and so on. Foresight, so strategic foresight, um, has particular methods which are the anticipatory and prospective ways of doing things. Um, we're going to touch on a couple of them today. Uh, and this is not by any means a definitive list in the same way that the list of designerly uh, ways is not a definitive list. Um, there are lots of different tools and lots of different ways of doing things in foresight uh, and um, we'll touch on a couple of them. Another uh, emerging area about InDesign uh, is transition design and this is looking at ways of designing things for transition but also in transis with transition, acknowledging that design is not just a way of, of designing for futures but a way of designing us as we move into those futures to come. So that transition design is a way of getting us to or being a stepping stone to particular futures. Um, there are other disciplines uh, or ways of doing futures, experiential futures. Uh, a lot of work has been, uh, been done uh, with significant pioneers in that space, uh, Stuart Candy and Jake Dunnigan. Um, and then there is the work of speculative and critical design, and that's not just the work of Don and Raby. There are there's a lot of work um, done, particularly within health and technology, that is speculative that allows us to. And I think the session today will cover this far better than I do. Uh, but thinking about how design can challenge us, as I said earlier, um, about what it is that we want from our futures. Um, the the <laughs> I suppose the rub, the hard stuff that I was saying before about things being hard, some of the hard stuff with both futures and design is understanding not just where you are and where you want to go, but the limits that you have around that. Um, it, it, I've worked in design for over 20 years and I've worked in futures for just over 10. And 
I I never ever have enough time to do all the stuff that I want to do, particularly not when I'm thinking about being in the problem space and imagining futures of. Um, well, I'm in a later slide, I've got an example of a piece of work we did in a class in 20 minutes because that was all we had. And a few days later, the students messaged me and said, can we do it again? Now that we've had time to think about it, we'd really like to spend more time going through that question and going through some of the issues again. We just never seem to give ourselves enough time to both really deeply understand the problem, uh, but also to think through what, what the causes are. And this is where things like root cause analysis um, are not just really useful to the process, but they're really useful to us as individuals to be able to, to question and critique a lot more readily um, than we would have uh, perhaps other ones. Um, the, the other challenge uh, that I, with futures and design is being able to push ourselves beyond what we think we need to be doing. Uh, and that is particularly around our expectations with design. Um, if we've got clients that have a particular expectation, so like this is what we want it to be, this is what it needs to look like. Uh, we, we need to push ourselves as in design practice and in futures practice to think about not just what should be based on where we are, but much more out to what could be. And this is that lovely imaginative capacity of futures that we don't always get in design. Whilst design is creative and is imaginative, we're often constrained too much uh, by the, the things that tell us this is what, this is the way it has to be done. This is the material that it has to be produced in. Yeah, you know, these are the, the various stakeholders in the, the system or service that we're designing. This is the space that we're constrained to. And that's the real today part of futures and design work. But in terms of imagining possibilities, we actually need to not have those constraints. And I, I think this is a little bit like when you have a brainstorming session and people haven't quite understood the difference between no but and yes and. And in futures, there is a lot of yes and, or yes with, yes, yes, and we could, yes versus. Um, so saying yes and building on it, even if it is building it in an oppositional way to an idea that's being put forward. And that kind of controversial, um, the playing devil's advocate and playing the, the, the antagonist, in, a, in a, deliberately arguing with someone about it, can really help um, push things out. Uh, and that then helps you think about what the limits are that you're working within. So often we start with constraint in design and foresight, and it's great to have constraint, but sometimes we need to push out and ask questions around what really should or shouldn't be constrained. Um, there's also uh, a, a question to be asked about where design and foresight fit and whether that's just fitting together or whether they align, whether they should be uh, doing things in slightly different ways. Um, this notion as the designer as a futurist or the, the futurist as a designer is not always going to be, be um, possible or, or practical um, in real life. And um, as I've worked in design for long enough to know that I don't do the stuff that a lot of designers do. My design work has always been at the more um, a strategic end, uh, but with input into creative. And I'm constantly in awe of what people do as designers to bring what I imagine and to bring to life what foresight work can be. Because uh, I, I, I love when a designer can say, I'm going to take that and I'm going to do this with it. Um, and I'm yeah, very, very, very grateful uh, for the designer as futurist who can take those imagined possibilities and give them form. And uh, equally, I'm grateful for the futurist who can challenge the boundaries of design. Um, because th there is a tension between foresight and design um, in that design isn't always the best answer that it could be. And by this, I mean the, the not understanding the unintended consequences of the things that we do. Uh, not being able to identify those unintended consequences early enough that we can work with them. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that um, as we move into doing a futures wheel in a little bit. 
So I thought I'd just talk a little bit about some of the, I suppose, the, the cliches um, that plague futures work. Uh, and one of them is about trends. Everyone has a look at trends and thinks that trends are great. Well, the problem with trends is that they're current. Um, so if you follow a trend, you're not ahead of a trend. Um, trends are things that we're seeing around us right now. Um, and trends are not the thing that we should follow. If someone else is doing it, it doesn't mean it's right for us. Uh, and this equally applies to fashion as it does to technology development, as it does to political and social cycles. Uh, and we can even see that in very tangible ways with um, the, the reports around how people are responding uh, to this global pandemic. Um, a lot of governments and, and, and countries are saying just because it's right for them doesn't mean it's right for us because we see that what might be really useful and has begun a trend of behaviour or a trend towards a particular service or product being provided in the, within a pandemic situation doesn't mean it's going to work for everyone. So we need to be really wary of friends. Um, and if you want to test it, go back and have a look at trend reports from five, ten years ago. Um, the stuff that we were told was going to be amazing and the, that, that we absolutely needed to have or do has probably fallen off the radar. Uh, I don't know how many of you remember when we first started looking at digital technologies as replacing print. And I've been reading headlines about the death of print publications um, probably since the, the early 2000s. Um, whereas I know for a fact from the stack of papers hiding behind me here uh, that print is not dead. Uh, we were promised a paperless office and we still don't have it. Uh, there are lots of things that we get told are going to happen and they're usually the views of the person who or the organisation that's telling you that. They're not necessarily the way it has to be. Um, and it also depends on what the priorities are. So what your priorities might be now um, compared to what they were six or 12 months ago, uh, it's okay if there's a distinct difference. In futures work, you need to understand how to allow for those shifts in priorities and to recognise that some things will happen that we weren't expecting and some things will happen that we were expecting and there'll be a whole lot of other things that we prepared for that didn't happen but we were still really prepared. Um, these are challenges uh, both for design and for foresight but when we're thinking about futures we go back to wanting that I need to know, I want that certainty, I, I need to know exactly how it's going to be and in actual fact we don't because if you look back even on the last few years of your life then there'll be a lot of things that didn't turn out the way you expected them to and we all manage pretty well. Uh, another phrase we use a lot uh, in foresight is to have a view and hold it lightly. Remember that things change and that it's important to be able to move and adapt. And this is where some of the design principles from Lean and Agile are useful to us. But we also need to think about not just that one thing on, it, on its own, in its own existence, it needs to be dealt with as part of a joined up situation. So not just thinking about one particular problem being solved with one particular solution thinking about a, a problem being part of a bigger picture. I was speaking with a group of people last week and, and someone said again, we have, we, how are we going to change the world? And I've been saying for a long time, and I'm not the only one, this, I'm not famous for this at all. Uh, it's, we don't, it's more important to think about finding the right things to change in the world. We don't need to change the whole world. The world is a system and we need to consider what we can change that causes the ripple effect through the rest of the system that brings about the kinds of changes that we might want. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, another thing to be mindful of in foresight work is, is avoiding business as usual. So in um, the scenarios models, which I'm going to get to in a second, um, there's a lot of discussion around uh, the different kinds of frameworks or archetypes that scenarios uh, might be part of. Business as usual is usually the, for the futures that we're given. So basically a continuation of where we are now, just maybe faster or more technocratic or with uh, alternative energies uh, fueling everything. 
Um, it might be that it's it's the, the same premise of shopping and living and consuming and learning and socialising as we know now, but in a more futuristic setting. And we often forget that um, that future is just an extension of where we are. We haven't acknowledged all of the things that might change along the way. Uh, and this is where good foresight work explores all of those possibilities. It'll never get it all right, um, which is why we don't do predictions as, as futurists. But if we start to think about, well, what are the consequences of these things? Now, if we're doing this and, and we're driving in this particular vehicle to go to this kind of work and we're doing these kinds of things, are we still going to be using the same kinds of gadgets and devices that we have around us? Or if we are using the same kinds of gadgets in five years that we are now, then what else has changed around us? What else is going to have to have been affected by our continued use of, of those things? But we need to not just be asking what we're designing, but what the impact and consequences of that will be for multiple different uh, communities, for multiple people, for different organisations and for different aspects. So this is where life-centred design becomes important. Um, there's a few game changers that I think uh, when I started writing these the other day, they're fairly generic because at the moment we're in a state of flux. Um, we have a a whole lot of stuff going on around us right now uh, and people are desperate for some for some predictions um, right here right now it's it's um it's an exciting space to be in but it's also a slightly terrifying space because there is so much that's changing um, and the consequences of the things that we are seeing shift even slightly on a daily basis um, I, I just they're, they're too extreme and too expensive to comment on today so if you were thinking about bigger game changes, um, particularly around futures of libraries, then these would be the kinds of things um, that are emerging at a global level, and you can start to track those back to uh, things that might have an impact. Um, so you know, changes in governments could mean changes of trade relationships, changes of national borders. At the moment, we've got people who can't go from one country to another. I probably won't be able to leave Australia uh, for another three, maybe six months, um, not because our borders are closed, but because if the, the challenges of two weeks isolation on return can be really hard. And it's those kinds of changes in governance at a social level um, that can have, have an impact on how you work and where you work and the resources that you need locally in society. So I thought I'd also tonight just touch on um, a couple of examples of, of some tools. Um, these are you know, foresight methods. Uh, they're examples of futures thinking methodologies or, or, or theories. Um, and there's a, a couple of um, different things that we might have played with. But um, does anyone have a question or anything that you want to ask it at this point? Oh, okay. I will go back to So this is what's known as the futures cone. Um, there are multiple variations on this, both by Joe Voros, who conceived the original model. This is the 2000 version. The most advanced um, is published on his blog, The Voroscope, uh, which now is now up to, I think, seven Ps. Uh, but he wrote a paper in 2003, which explores this more in depth. What this does is, explain the principle or visualize the principle of the further out in time you go, the more possible futures there are. So we start from a particular point in time now, and as you look out, and this is from an individual perspective, it doesn't mean that it's the only perspective, but from where you start, stand in that particular position, um, you have a number of potential futures in front of you. 
and there will be some um, that in the multiple possible futures. There will be some that are plausible that you think maybe could happen. There will be some that are probably going to happen. So they're the probable futures, the ones that are, am I you know, at some point in the next six months, is my train going to be late for work? Yeah, probably. Um, is it plausible that it will be more than once a month? Yes, it is. Is it possible that it could be as frequent as once a week? Absolutely. Uh, my preferred future is that my train is never late for work. Uh, and the further out in time you go, the more possible futures there are. It's up to us to think through and evaluate the kinds of futures that we want and therefore, as, as an individual, but also therefore work as a collective, as part of our family or our community or as part of our society, whether it be at an organisational level where we work and where we live or as part of society at a government and a policy level to think about the futures that are going to be preferred. And some organisations chase what they think are the plausible futures. Oh, that's the one that's most likely which is risky because it, we don't have to deal with the ones that are most likely. What we have to be aware of are the things that are likely to happen and therefore do the things we need to do to either shift those. So is it 12 months ago, were we asking, is it plausible that we'll have a global pandemic in the next 12 months to two years? Absolutely. Um, was it considered possible? Absolutely. Was it considered probable? No, but if we stretch that time frame out to five years, there were people who were saying you know, we are definitely kind of due for a pandemic. It's, it's inevitable that we have one in the next few years. There are people who talked about a pandemic and wrote about a pandemic being probable uh, in the next couple of years, and that was only a couple of years ago. So it wasn't a prediction, uh, but it was a forecast about a possibility that was seen as more than possible and more than likely to happen and therefore probable. Uh, for no one uh, was that probable future a preferred future. Uh, so the, if you want the details on the paper for this, then I'm more than happy to provide that. It is freely available. You don't need uh, journal access to read it. Uh, but it's a really good paper and it talks about the difference, not just between the different P's of futures, but also how um, you can um, consider and, and kind of measure up which kind of futures are likely to be coming your way. Um, scenarios. There's a lot of people who think that all foresight and all futures work is, is scenarios. Uh, yep, there is a lot of scenarios work done, uh, and this is just one example of how scenarios are developed. Um, there are different models, there are generative scenarios, uh, there's the Manoa method for generating scenarios or developing scenarios which was developed uh, by Wendy Schultz uh, and then there is the model uh, which is the four quadrant model uh, which was developed not as a model uniquely but um, developed as the, the archetypal ways of thinking about futures known as Dator's four archetypes. Um, they're characterised in these ways, continuation, which can also be growth, collapse and collapse, um, collapse of a, a, a state, um, that the state that we're in, so that the way of life completely collapses. Um, discipline is equivalent to constraint and a transformation scenario is one that transforms from one state to another. They're not seen as distinct or uh, unique and, and discrete uh, scenarios, they do exist not so much in a, in a cycle, but in a system where um, there is flow from one kind of future into another. So for example, um, we've had periods of, of significant growth uh, around the world. Um, and in the late 2000s, eventually that financial growth got to a point where we entered into a state of financial collapse pretty much unilaterally uh, across the world. Um, that led to a sense of constraint around financial uh, use and, and the way we, we uh, societies responded and governments responded. And eventually that led us into a transformation scenario, scenario whereby we were able to start to move into the next state. Now from transformation, you can move into any of the other states. 
Um, you don't have to go from constraint into transformation and then back into growth. Transformation can actually mean that you go into a completely different state, such as back to constraint, or you might go into um, a, a back into a collapse scenario because something didn't work. Um, the other thing about these is uh, topologies is that they're not they're not definitive and they're not all negative or positive. Um, each of these as a as a uh, such as a topology has both negative and positive uh, characteristics. And so, for example, um, constraint or discipline, um, we're, we're kind of living in a form of constraint as a world scenario at the moment because we have constraint around what we do and where we go and not being able to travel and what we can buy and, and how we socialise and things like that. But that's not necessarily a bad form of constraint. It's not necessarily the kind of... Uh, rules and regulations that people struggle with. It doesn't mean that we have um, a you know, military rule, or whether we, it doesn't mean that we have civil unrest and militia on the streets. Um, so, how we perceive this, I'm just going to go back to this slide for a second. How we perceive those different scenario typologies very much depends on where we sit in the world and what our views of futures are which is why when we use something like the futures cone, we do need to remember that it's a view, it's not the view. And so my, as I said earlier, my dystopia might be your utopia. And that's completely okay because everyone has a different perspective. And so when it comes to looking through scenarios, the different typologies are very much dependent on where you are in the world and what's important to you. And growth can be good as much as growth can be bad. Collapse can be good. Collapse can be the breakdown of systems that lead to new forms of, of, of social um, benefit. Uh, and, and that doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. Just because something collapses doesn't mean it's, it's all going to be awful afterwards. Uh, this is another way of imagining futures, uh, and it's called Harman Fan. It's a very simple tool. It's actually um, when uh, Roman talked about the workshops that I ran last year, this is not from that workshop, but this is one of the methods that I ran in that workshop. Um, and you start with a dateline. Um, in this case, uh, we went out to 2049. This was done last year in a class, and we were looking at um, futures of food and fo uh, around food security, so making sure that everyone had access to food equally. Um, this brought about different pathways through to different outcomes um, through to 2049. It's a really lovely way of exploring the ridiculous ideas because uh, you basically write headlines or sound bites uh, from futures, the things that you can imagine reading or hearing. Uh, and then you use those uh, to explore the possible pathway from one to the other. So uh, there's a term I'm not going to talk about today, uh, today which is backcasting. And Harman Fan relies on you being able to see the pathway forward um, and backcasting might be the thing that you do to figure out how you avoid getting to some of the more negative outcomes that can be explored to this, or indeed any of the negative outcomes. Backcasting is also something you would do if you have a vision in mind, but what are the steps that we need to put in place? So it's, um, it's, it's similar to strategic planning in the, in the sense that you set out a pathway, but backcasting means that you do it backwards from a particular vision in time. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is futures wheel because this is what we're going to have a go at doing. Um, this is an example of a futures wheel that we did in class, the one I was talking about earlier. Um, with the futures wheel exercise, you're looking for first, second and third order consequences. So this is a way of seeing how things might happen and how they might affect other things. So in this particular exercise, uh, we looked at uh, futures of design leadership. So what is happening around design leadership post-COVID-19? What would be the opportunities for people working in design? Are there opportunities for design leadership to emerge? Could design be used in, in better ways or more pragmatic ways? Um, and so the exploration was around what are the, the, the possibilities? And you can see in this slide that uh, there were there were opportunities expressed that were good as well as bad. So uh, the opportunity uh, means that th there's an ability for designers to empathise uh, to empathise, and that is an increased ability. 
Um, but you've also got potential long-term isolation as a consequence of where we are in this world post-COVID-19. Um, another potential negative or positive is the awareness or obsession with hygiene, um, which leads to an increase in demand for products, which means it puts pressure on resources and so on and so forth. So this is the exercise that I thought we might do now um, using a version of Jamboard that I set up. So I'm just going to go and in and make sure that this is set up so that you should be able to use it. I'm just checking the sessions. Yes, it's definitely available for you all to edit. So if you go back into that link from Jamboard, there should be a second page that you would be able to move to. I'm just going to go in and open this up with my screen in front of everyone. So I now, I now have that screen in front of you. I, I'm, you should all be able to see that screen. Yes. Okay. So similar principle before where you have some um, sticky notes that you can use. I've put in a few thoughts based on a little bit of reading that I did and some thoughts that came through from another project. You can add on more sticky notes by heading over to the left-hand side. Um, that's a pen that you can write with and there's an eraser if you make a mistake, but this is the important one here because it allows you to generate a sticky note. So you create your own sticky notes over on the left-hand side in the menu here in the little square box, uh, and you're able to add to this. So what I'm hoping is in the next five or ten minutes, you can all add your thoughts around futures of libraries based on some of the things that I've been talking about so thinking about what are, the, what are the futures for libraries? Uh, yeah, great, community development. Um, are there challenges in futures of libraries that you want to cover off in this? And as you're placing these, what we want to think about is in that the example I just showed you, you, know, you might have noticed that there were um, circles and lines connecting some of the squares. That's because what we want to do is show where the where the connections and consequences are. So, for example, if they're in a library in the future, there's no due date for returns. That could mean that books go missing for years. It could mean that only the people who borrowed the book ever get to read it. It could mean that if a really popular book was never returned and it was only available as a, a, a physical book and it was out of print, then it might never able, be able to be replaced in the library. So I'm hoping that you'll just have a little go at some ideas for what you would like to see as futures for libraries. And what I might do is you can all see that screen. You can see the changes that are coming. I might just go out of here and see. Are there any questions that anyone has that you want to ask while you're adding to that board? And you can type it in chat if you don't want to ask it using the microphone. Oh, cool. Libraries out people. That's awesome. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. And if you can see a connection between libraries without people and something else on there, then show the connection. So if we have augmented reality, does that mean that we get only e-libraries? Does that mean that it leads to something else? So are there different things that you can imagine? Yeah. 
You can also think about um, something that we that gets used in uh, a lot of strategic work as well as foresight um, is a framework called either PEST or STEEP or PESTL or STEEPL. Um, then there's another couple of variations that are used a lot more in foresight. Um, one particularly is STEEPL and then there's VSTEEP. And this is a framework that you might have heard at Hobbs has PEST, which is the external forces, political, economic, social, and technological. Using something like steeple adds in environmental, ethical, and legal uh, to the discussion. Oh, you can't see, smell, or touch the books. Uh, I love new books and the end papers. I have a, yeah weakness for bookstores and just touching beautiful paper. Uh, but if you if you think about categorizing the things that are coming up, even if you just do it in your head, you know, what are the possibilities? Um, what are the social changes that we might see? Uh, I have a three and a half year old nephew who loves books and doesn't like reading on an iPad, but I have a seven year old nephew who is addicted to his tablet device, not just for games, but for reading and doing a whole lot of other stuff as well. Um, so socially, there might be changes that occur. Um, at a technology level, uh, you know, we may have more technology, but we face a crisis of resources at the moment. Uh, we don't know that we continue, can continue to produce the number of digital devices that we currently rely on. We don't know that we can continue to provide the energy required to power those devices and provide all of the online resources that we would access. So we need to think about the, uh, the not just the technology from a technology perspective, but powering it. So the economic issues around this, um, what are the complications for that? I love that things like the Copyright Act and things like that are being brought in. Um, so that the categorizations um, what I'm going to do is put them on a little one here. I'm just writing it out uh, so that you can think about this maybe as a framework. Um, I love Steeple as a way of um, categorizing issues when I'm thinking through a bigger problem. Um, uh, because it's such a, a, once you get to know it, um, it's an easy framework to use. Um, so I'm just typing it in here on a sticky note now. I'm gonna put it, I'm gonna put it up here, down here on the right hand side out of the way. And I'm going to edit it so that it doesn't have any color. Um, but for me, that's a really important list to work with. Um, thinking about all of those different aspects that might affect us. Um, it, if you were to do uh, an environmental scan, um, a horizon scan, then Steeple is a really good way of, uh, it's a good framework for capturing things where you think, oh, that's a, an emerging issue, that's a weak signal. What does that mean? Um, what are the consequences of that? So uh, I, I find Steeple really useful. And it's just an extension of, of a PEST framework or a STEEP framework that you might be more familiar with. This is great. I wonder if libraries will ever change their name, given that the word library is derived from the Latin word libris and refers to a book. We have less experience with books. If we've got limited books or they're all e-books, are we still going to call them libraries? Um, I know that we have toy libraries and we have tool libraries, uh, which are places that you can borrow toys for kids and return them. Um, and tools. Um, I don't know if you have tool libraries, but they've become really popular uh, in Australia. So you don't have to, it don't, not everyone in the street is going to buy a hammer. You can share them with others. It's great. So 
the principle here, which we would start, if we had a bit more time, we could work through it. We'd actually start to categorise things um, in what would be considered first, second and third order consequences. So I've got this little funny pink dot. Um, and this, this would allow us to say, well, if, if libraries in the future were all e-libraries, then there would be first, second and third order consequences here. And that might have consequences down. Of course, they're going to be open 24 hours. Yes, they're potentially more friendly for people with a disability. Um, would it actually mean that people would uh, you know, have challenges if they, you know, what about the pressure we have on our health around being attached to a screen for too long? Would it mean that um, we would be using screens even more? Would we have more eye problems? Would we have greater consumption of electricity to power them? Would we be constantly looking for more and more devices? Um, I lost my Kindle six months ago um, and I really thought I would be able to find it and unfortunately I think I left it on an aeroplane uh, and I finally decided that whilst I really want to be able to read on a Kindle, I have a perfectly serviceable um, little uh, foldable laptop tablet thing and I'm going to use that for a while rather than buy another device because I'm just very conscious of having another device. Um, it could mean that you know, no due date means no stress and, and maybe less books. If it's an e-library, then do I have to have a due date? Do I just you know, use it? I, I can read it for free over a six-month period. Um, through my library at my university, we have a lot of books that we can read as an e-publication um, over a three- or six-month period and others that you, you can just read online for free at any time. Um, so does it change the nature of borrowing? Does that have complications or implications for the Copyright Act? Um, another way that a futures wheel is uh, referred to is an implications wheel because it, show, it starts to show the implications of decisions being made. Um, but this is just a, a lovely tool for exploring lots of possibilities and lots of consequences so that when we're th thinking through not just the futures that we want, we're thinking about preventing the futures that we don't want. So if we want a future for libraries to be available and we think that there are issues with, with waste or usage or access or that if we think it's a bad thing that libraries don't have people in them, if we think that there's going to be a huge loss, uh, a sensory loss because we can't touch or see or smell the books, then what would we do to replace that? Um, do we think it needs to be replaced or is that just something that we move on from in the same way that we no longer have the smell of steam engines when we travel on a train? Um, so that's the point of this um, as a tool, um, as part of the futures exercise. Um, and that was what I was going to talk to you about tonight. Um, the, the possibilities for futures as libraries, for futures of libraries, is really up to you. Uh, and I'm, I say that not being flippant. I realise that we all have to work within constraint: policies, economics, um, available resources, uh, by buildings and infrastructure. Um, what it is that we we want to use, um, what we can do in certain buildings, what we're allowed to do, what is considered safe, and so on. Uh, but it's up to us to uh, really think through what those possibilities are so that we can shape the futures that we want. Because as I said at the beginning, the future is not done. It's, it, it hasn't been created. It's up to us to do it. So it's up to us to think through the futures that we want for libraries. And then I thought I would just open it up for questions while you continue Talking, Roman, do you want me to cover anything else? Thank you, Bridget. Thank you very much for your lecture. So, does anybody have a question on Bridget? You, uh, if you're sure, you can also write it down to the chat. Ah, there is something. 
Ah, uh, good question. So the question is it more foresights than futures? It's a strategic foresight tool. So it's a tool used to help imagine possible futures and help work through all the possibilities and the consequences. So those unintended and intended consequences. So is it a tool for futures? Yes, it is. Uh, but is it, it's a strategic foresight tool in itself. So it's designed to help you think through and open up. So what I was saying earlier about it being both divergent and convergent. So it allows you to open up the possibilities as well as look at them and go, oh, that's actually not such a good thing. Maybe we should decide how we would get around that. Uh, or maybe that's something we wouldn't do. Uh, does that answer your question? I hope it does. Ah, uh, there's a question here about what do you think about the restrictions of online document databases due to the Copyright Act? Do you think there should be less restrictions to document access given the current situation? That's a really hard question because this is linked to people's rights as a creator. Um, there is the possibility that we could have more access to things because we can't we can't go and get them otherwise. Um, however, as long as we respect the moral rights and the legal rights of someone who has created something, um, I think it's fine. If you're asking more about the restrictions with, say, some of the online university databases, I would love to see those freed up. Um, uh, it, it, there's, a, there's a whole publishing empire that exists within the university uh, and academic publications that we haven't got long enough tonight for me to rant on about it for a while. But it's, it's really disappointing that we can't share things equitably, uh, but it's often because we don't respect the rights of the person who created it. So I think that, yeah, if we could agree to have temporary um, access, uh, particularly if it encourages people to see the value uh, in the work that they're accessing, that would be great. The question I have then, though, um, is what happens when we go back to whatever the next period is for us? Um, there's a lot of discussion at the moment about the next normal or the new normal or post-COVID-19. Um, there is no post-COVID-19. We have COVID-19 and we have the coronavirus around. It's not going to go away and we don't have a vaccine. So if when you play this back to the question around opening up or making database access less restricted, when do you decide that you go back to restricting it again? So by opening it up, you actually then have to force a bigger discussion around when do you return back to what it is that we used to have? And is that fair? Um, do we then diminish the rights of those who've become reliant on access to those databases? Um, which is why a futures wheel is a useful tool to, tool to explore a question like, um, what are the consequences of this? Because uh, I don't know how we would go back from something like that. Um, I've been offered free subscriptions to a number of um, publications just magazines and stuff like that, nothing really amazing. But they've offered me free subscriptions for three months or six months. And I expect it's in the hope that I'll be so entr entranced by these magazines, by these publications, that I won't, um, I, I won't leave, a, I will continue with the subscription and I won't leave it at a free subscription. I'll actually pay for it. But I don't know whether I will or not, and there's probably a risk. And, and at a commercial level, you can see why someone might offer it free for a few months as a, 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 a gesture of brand goodwill. Uh, but I don't know whether you can apply the same kind of framework to something that considers people's authorial rights. So the copyright protects you as an author creating something. Uh, you as a, 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 and when I say author, I mean anyone creating something. Um, and it's important that we respect those rights because um, copyright is often the only thing we have to fall back on and protect ideas. I hope that answers your question.
yeah, so maybe paid memberships. Um, maybe we could look at um, maybe we could look at different models. And I think again, this is that possibility. If you think about the futures cone, what would be that preferred future? It would be that everyone could have more equitable access to that. And so, is there a point at, in time where the, the world says, "Gee, we're in a bad way. Everyone needs to have this for free." Um, this has been really difficult. Everyone needs to have this at a reduced rate. So yes, you know, we, we could look at different models. And it's those kinds of ideas that challenge um, the expectation as well, it's always going to be paid. It's always going to have to be like this. It doesn't always have to be like that. Um, it's up to us to think through what are the possibilities, which I know I keep saying, but that is up to us. Uh, Raman, your question, cooperation of people like me, yes, there are. So I've, um, I've actually just uh, finished doing a small piece of work through a design agency around future of work. Uh, so the agency was briefed to take on a particular project and uh, it, it ended up being a more foresight and futures oriented project. So I got on board to help them with that. Um, and there is quite a bit of design uh, as in strategic design, service design, uh, and human-centered design used in some policy work, but it, it varies. Uh, there's, um, there's a couple of design agencies that do a lot of work with government redesigning uh, the way uh, ministerial practice has happened. Uh, and uh, in fact, one of my best friends works in government and uh, she's leading a project using de design to reconfigure certain parts of their consultation process with um, the Australian community um, because these this kind of foresight work unfortunately to the second part of your question it doesn't get done often enough and yes a lot of this is political um, and while we live in a world that is is complex and volatile um, politicians like to feel like they can give people the certainty that we think we need uh, and there isn't as much foresight work done in Australia within government as many of us would like. But I know that there are governments. So Singapore um, has a wonderful foresight practice and, and futures work is, is done quite extensively. Uh, in the UK, uh, there's a lot of foresight and design linked together, uh, not just in the, the designing of, of new government services and, and offerings, uh, but design, foresight and innovation are very heavily embedded, and I mean heavily in a good way, um, embedded within a lot of the, the practice that it is, is for people, for, for residents, for citizens of the United Kingdom. Um, there's an organisation called NESTA, uh, which is N E. I'll put it in here. Um, and they have a, um, a big... Uh, a, a, their unit um, has a, a big commitment uh, to foresight and futures work in policy development, service development, um, and just programs and, and stuff that government does. But unfortunately, most politicians don't look past the next political cycle. And I, I'm smiling as I say that. Um, it's, they, yeah, they often don't look past the the, the next round of votes. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, great, oh, great. No, there's very little we can do about that. Technological level of society. Oh, well, um, I, um, I'm really disappointed with some of the, the technology that we do and don't have access to. Um, I was in Estonia at the end of last year and it was everything that I'd expected. Uh, however, um, there was a reliance on technology that um, was great when I had connection uh, because I was using a roaming system and it wasn't always the best. There were times when I wasn't connected, uh, but I could see how connected everything was. And I, by connected, I don't just mean connected to or through technology and internet, people were connected with each other and there was a really nice seamless um, sense of continu real continuity. Um, I think Australia, uh, in terms of technology, 
it's a little bit, when I say behind, it, it's difficult for us to have fast, reliable broadband across Australia. We're a really big country and the middle of our country is desert. And it's hard to get power out there, let alone have a stable internet connection. I think we've lagged a little bit with online education, partly uh, for cultural reasons. So we, we just, we've, we've maybe had much more of an outdoor lifestyle than some other parts of the world. Um, online culture is is growing. Uh, we have incredible challenges with with um, bad behaviour online. I think everyone does around the world, but we do have um, a lot of really nasty, a um, lot of trolls and a lot of um, really awful uh, behaviour online. So I I don't know whether that answers your question or not, but um, I think I think we could certainly do better. Um, I think we could be more sophisticated around technology. And there's stuff that we don't get because we are a big country with not a lot of people for the size. Um, there are some technologies that we just don't have uh, and are not available here. So particular devices and particular uh, technologies just, just don't get used. But I don't know whether that really answers your question, but I think we could be more sophisticated. Um, and I, I mean sophisticated in the, in the delivery of the technology as well as that use of it. And multiple languages makes it more challenging as well. Thank you. Now, we often have to translate stuff into 22, 23, maybe even 25 languages. So producing a government website in all of those languages, is it gets pretty, it's a big job. Yeah, it's my pleasure. But I, I, yeah, sorry about the detail. <laughs> Is there anything else that anyone wants to ask? I don't know. Ah, okay. So um, in terms of learning, um, I'm happy to provide you with uh, the lists of things um, that you could read because that's what I do. Um, there are uh, programs, um, undergraduate and postgraduate programs around the world. Um, we teach some foresight at the university that I'm at. Uh, we had one of the, the longest running foresight programs that it got put on hold a couple of years ago. Um, there are some online programs uh, through universities uh, in uh, the US um, and some programs in the US. And I think there's one in, I'm saying there's one in Europe, but I'm not 100% sure, so don't quote me on that. Uh, but there are also programs that you can do via various providers. Um, the Institute for the Future uh, runs uh, courses online that you can do. Uh, and the, the, the quality of their programs is, is really high. Um, there are also things that you can read. Um, I believe that everyone has the capacity to be a futurist in, in, in the same way that we all can be creative. Um, it doesn't mean that everyone's gonna be a professional futurist but we certainly um, we certainly have the capacity so I can um, send Roman a, a, some reading and you can share it um, I would love to say so the next question is what do you think on merging of different types of libraries and commercial and public sectors in future uh, my thoughts are that this would be good if we can make it work um, I have great hesitation about huge mergers uh, that get done for one significant reason. Um, you know, sometimes it's money, sometimes it's resources, sometimes it's you know, the, the merging of different sectors. Um, my hesitation is always around what are the consequences of that. So if it means that there's a strengthening of resources and that public and private become more collaborative and it becomes shared resources and it benefits more broadly, that sounds great. If it means that it did mean if it means that there's a limit on access for certain sectors of the community or that commercial drivers such as you know, the, the cost of doing things becomes the, the becomes an increase in fees or usage costs for people who want to use a library, uh, then that's really difficult. And even if you get into things like user pays, 
um, then that's equally difficult because if you can't afford anything, then you don't do anything. Uh, and there's a privilege that comes with some of those things. So it, I know I'm not giving you an answer, but it, it's, it's really hard. I'd, I'd, I'd want to seriously consider what the, what the challenges were with that before rushing into things. But it, it sounds like it could be done well. And it's also something that we need to explore this. We need to explore things that will sustain us and allow humanity to thrive. And culture, which is where libraries contribute such a significant, um, well, they're, well they're, they're a major part of culture. Um, their contribution is huge and it's such, such a significant marker of our history as well uh, that it would be nice to think that we could find a better way of doing things um, that will actually help us thrive. I, uh, thank you, Bridget. Uh, we have the time for uh, one more question now. I think. Okay, if there is no... Uh, Mr. Shibesta is writing something. Ah, so a daily has its offer of happiness e-books. Oh, so you, so you get a packet of ebooks as a benefit of doing something. Is that right? Uh, yeah, and I suppose it depends on what they're also wanting you to sign up for. I know I'm probably being cynical, but um, no, I'm skeptical. I always wonder you know, what the books are. There's nothing wrong with books. All books are good, but what are the books about? What is it promoting? What does it support? So <laughs> maybe I'm being too sceptical. <laughs> ah, if you pay a year membership. Mm. Well, if the books are books that you might want to read, if they're going to be useful to you, then it's, and yeah. That's when I would look at the practicality of it and think about, you know, what am I going to get out of this? What's the overall cost to me? And am I actually going to benefit? Am I going to derive benefit from it? And not just in economic terms. So if there is um, any more, if there is not any more questions, then we can, I think then it's, thank you, Bridget. Thank you for this wonderful time okay. and this wonderful lecture. Uh, great, thank you. I'm maybe... so excited for what you did with the Jamboard. That's great. I'll mm -hmm. save it and send it to you. Uh, is it okay when we like uh, publish your email somewhere and uh, send it to the participants of the call? Of, of course, absolutely. Um, and if anyone has any more questions, I'm really happy to answer them via email. Equally, if you want to set up a time to do a you know, 10 minute chat or something like that, then I can do that too. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if you want to participate uh, or if you want to visit also the John's lecture. May uh, I? It, I, I, yeah, <laughs> it will be actually on the same, same link, but it's, uh, I think it's too late for you maybe, or I don't know what time is it in Australia now? It's only 8.30. Oh, okay, okay. So I could go and get a glass of wine and then listen to it. <laughs> okay, so the it, uh, the lecture will start at uh, twelve uh, or at uh, two o'clock, so it's in two hours actually. Uh, for you, it's uh, at eleven, I think. Yeah, send yeah. me the link. <laughs> okay, so uh, I will switch to the to check for uh, for a few moments. Uh, Thank you, Grant. Bye. Uh, bye. A takže děkuji všem, co se teďka zúčastnili první části. Teď bude teda přestávka na oběd a potkáme se tady zase ve dvě hodiny na tom stejným, na tom stejným linku, na té, v té stejné místnosti. Ten odkaz bude fungovat. Bude tu s námi John Jung, který tu byl teda i teď, který, nám, který působí v knihovně v Chicago a působí jako spekulativní designer. Doufám, že se tady zase potkáme v hojném počtu. Jsem vlastně rád, že nás tady bylo teďka tolik a jsem, je, to, je to super. A dobrou chuť všem teď a uvidíme se za chvíli. Tak.
Zatím. Thank you.